Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into partition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest, or which thou saw, are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. And he, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this chapter, when I first started looking at it, I thought, I haven't studied this much, and I'm not certain I'm going to be able to grab something out of it, even considered going and preaching somewhere else. But in reading this chapter, it's interesting because this almost is one of those chapters that is perfect for that. Because it literally will take something that's a mystery, and then a few passages later just give you exactly what it is in plainer English. So... You'll see that as I read through here. We're going to get to know a few characters that have been introduced in other chapters previous and will be mentioned further in chapters to come. But here it's almost like the, uh, the index or the, the appendix that just kind of allows you to get a bigger grasp of the context in and around it. Go to verse 1, for example. Verse 1, it says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. There's our first character, is that great whore, and she's going to be discussed here. Here the angel pulls John aside and says, I'm going to show you the judgment of this woman. We're going to learn a few things about this woman just in the context of the chapters as he starts to highlight who this woman is. It says of the great whore that, A, first of all, she sitteth upon many waters. What in the world does that mean? Well, look, clearly in verse 15, there it is. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's why I love this book and the revealing or the revelation of Jesus Christ is that it will take something that's kind of 
confusing and kind of vague. Okay, she's sitting on water is great. Well, what does that mean? And only at the end of the chapter it just plainly says it. the waters clearly here are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. I said early on in the chapter or in the study of Revelation that when you see waters, it's indicating that. It's indicating great multitudes of people quite often with prophetic language. And so her sitting on many waters indicates that she has a far-reaching influence and dominion over these waters. What are these waters? Again, it's clear. Peoples, multitudes, nations, tongues. She's sitting upon them, meaning they are under her. She has dominion over top of them, right? Whenever you're, you're wrestling with, with, a, with a brother, right, or, or, or a sibling, when you hold them down and you pin them and you say, say, uncle, you now have dominion, right? You're in charge. You're the boss, right? So that's exactly what's being indicated here. This horse sits upon peoples and multitudes, nations, tongues, the whole world that has an influence and dominance over them. The next thing we learn about her is that she is arrayed in purple. We see that listed right, uh, right in the next uh, context of verse 4. It says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations um, her, and filthiness of her fornication. So she's arrayed in a certain way of purple, of scarlet, of gold, pearls, precious riches. That indicates her great and vast wealth, this woman. Purple is often likened unto a royal attire. Remember when they were mocking Jesus and they put that purple robe upon him? They did that to mock him and say, Oh, hail, king of the Jews. They didn't recognize him as king, but putting purple on him was like a sign. Oh, look at you. You're the king. You're wonderful. You're royal. You're real. And, they, and they lauded him mockingly in that circumstance. She's wearing purple. She's wearing scarlet. Also, she is wearing this great array of gold, pearls, precious stones, indicating her vast wealth. So we see of her, she sits and influences over peoples, nations, multitudes, and tons, and she is arrayed in wealth and riches. It says at the end of that verse 4, it says that she has a cup of judgment in her hand. It says, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Why do I say that that's a cup of judgment? I believe this is the same cup that has been kind of passing through the pages as we've, as we've read. Revelation 14 is the first place we'll go. Revelation 14. And look with me in verse 9. Revelation 14 and verse 9 it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, Revelation 14 and verse 10 now. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So this horse sits upon these many people, nations, kindreds, and tongues, that by and large will take that mark of the beast. And we've seen that and how it, how it rolled out in Revelation chapter 13 and how many accepted it even unto the end of the wrath of God in Revelation 16, where they're blaspheming as the hailstones fall upon them because they have such hatred of God. Therefore, he's pouring out his wrath without mixture, and it almost seems like mockingly she just has a cup of that indignation, the symbol of her judgment, the symbol of her filthiness and, and her just deserts that are coming as a result of her actions, her fornication, her influence over the world. Verse 16 continues and, and gives an, another example of what I'm referring to. Chapter 16, sorry, Revelation 16 and verse 5, and it says, And I heard, now this is the third angel here pouring out his vial of judgment as they become blood, the waters and rivers and fountains there. It says, And I heard in verse 5, the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another angel of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous, and righteous are thy judgments. And so, these that have, that have um, persecuted, murdered, attacked, um, and, and sent through great trials, the, the people of God 
are judged righteously by the Lord in that he gives them blood to drink. And then there's that woman again with that golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I believe she's been given blood to drink. What well, makes me think that? Well, not from verse 4, but if you look right down in verse 6, what does it say? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with great admiration. So there in her hand is a cup, I believe, of the wrath of God, a cup full of the blood of the saints. And, and it's there because of their abominations. It's there because of the filthiness of her fornication. And she's drunk with it. She's, she's, she's out of her mind with it. She's, she's not sober anymore because the blood of the saints is upon them. And as the angel cried out, Lord, you gave them blood to drink. They were worthy of it. They deserve that. And he is righteous to do so. The second angel gives, gives affirmation of that. So we see then this horse sitteth by many waters and has influence over the world. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet, very rich, very wealthy. And we see also that she has that cup of judgment almost mockingly in her hands. And she gets drunk off the blood of saints and martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ. As an affront to him, lifting that cup, I believe, in his name and spiteful behavior. Next we see that she's identified very clearly. As, as the generator or as the mother of many of these abominations of the earth. Not only does she sit upon and have dominion over them, she actually created the abominable things and the abominable people at this time. It says in verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written. Very clearly, she's identified. You can see this name, bright and bold, all caps in your King James Bible. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I would think anybody that has a daughter would think that that's the last thing that you would want plastered on her forehead. And yet this woman, this whore, this harlot, she is marked with that identifier as the generator or life giver of such that are abominable harlots in this earth. But she's not a life giver so much as a giver of death in reality. Because what she's offering, harlotry and whoredom and abomination, that's not life. That's death. Sin begets death, right? Wages of sin is death. And so when she's progenerating or creating these abominations in all of those in the world and creating little harlots that identify with her, she's signifying that she's not a giver of life, but she's very clearly a giver of the wage of sin, which is death, and, and, and pro progenerating and creating more of that death. Proverbs back, uh, chapter 7 will show you what I mean. And maybe Proverbs chapter 7 isn't referring exactly to Mystery Babylon the Great, but it could be referring to one of her daughters. Proverbs chapter 7. By type, though, I think we can apply these very characteristics unto Mystery Babylon. As God describes trying to warn his son of the strange woman. Chapter 7, I'll begin reading. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye, bind upon thy fingers, write them upon the tables of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. Why? Verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. I'm going to quickly go back to chapter 5 and look at verse 3. It talks about this strange woman. It says, for the lips of a strange woman, chapter 5, verse 3, drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And if she has as a two-edged sword in her mouth, that's why we need the two-edged sword of the Word of God in order to battle with her. And that's exactly what Solomon is telling his son at this time. Why do we need to be on guard for this? Look at verse 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Her desire is to draw men away from the path of life and draw them unto the paths of death, sin, contempt, judgment of God when they sin against them. 
And then that phrase is very interesting. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And this is one of the reasons why I don't believe Mystery Babylon the Great is something that we can just nail down and say, it's the Roman Catholic Church, and that's just it. A lot of people do that. They'll see her in scarlet and in purple and in gold and precious stones and be like, yep, that's the Vatican, that's the woman, that's the one we're looking for. But the Bible's clear. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And there have been those that are like um, Rome throughout all times. She is the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. So you can't nail her down. Her ways are movable. You start to think you haven't figured out who is this harlot woman. And suddenly she's changed a little bit. She's shape-shifted. She's altered her motives and her ways of dealing with people. I believe that she is a religious leader. And she is a religious, uh, has a religious mindset about her. But it's not something I believe that we can just nail down. She's going to move. As soon as you think you have her in your sights, you're targeting, all right, I know who Mystery Babylon the Great is, suddenly she's distracted you and moved. Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. You cannot determine exactly who it is. Going back to Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to continue reading about this strange woman that flattereth with her words. 7 and verse 6, it says, For at the window of my house I looked through my casement. And so this guy's at home. He should be safe at this time, but we know David wasn't safe when he was up on his rooftop from the allurement and the draw of the strange woman. Verse 7 says, And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. So he's looking down and he's seeing, Hey, I could be just like that guy if I wasn't up here hiding away. If I wasn't up here wise to these things. Son, hear these words, lest you be like the one, the simple one that's down there, getting prepared to be tripped up and trapped by the lusts of your flesh, as the strange woman, it says in verse 8, passing through the street near her corner. And he went in the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the entire of a harlot and subtle of heart. And so this woman finds exactly what she's looking for. The problem was, it looks as if he was looking for the same thing. There's no reason for a young man to be out passing through the street near her corner in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. You ought to be home up on the casement like the one that's watching this fool that's about to fall into the correction of the stocks. Verse 11, it says, She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Think of Mystery Babylon, the one that sitteth upon many waters. Think of great women that are revered in this life and how they behave exactly like this. Loud and stubborn, feet not abiding in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. See how her ways are movable? She's all over the place. She's at every corner. Does that mean that this one harlot is just getting on every corner? No, it means there's one just like her on every corner. Dime a dozen is what it's referring to. The danger and the fear is that there is... A, a daughter of Mystery Babylon waiting for a man that is unwise to get trapped and tripped up into this. So it continues on in verse 13. It says, So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face, said unto him, I have peace offerings. See how she's religious? I'm so religious. I have peace offerings with me this day, and I have paid my vows. I'm a good Christian, right? She comes and allures him with that. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and have found thee. Right? She's puffing him up. Oh, I came just looking for thee, just looking for someone like thee. She was saying the same thing to somebody else the night before. Verse 16, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestries, with carved work, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love. And it's not love. Until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. 
Young and old, we ought to take heed to these types of things. And women aren't immune to be drawn in by the strange woman and her lust and her flattery and her words and how she uses to draw you into sin. It's not just the particular sexual sin that's being referred to here, the adultery that she's drawing away that, that foolish young man into. No, she'll draw you into any type of sin that'll keep you from following after him. Any type of lust, any type of carnal desire that will keep you from serving God, she's okay with it. Satan's okay whatever thing you choose to distract yourself from serving the God of heaven. He's okay with it. He'll draw you away with anything. And Mystery Babylon the Great, this mother of harlots, is no different. Now you can see where the power of this particular strange woman, this mystery woman, is derived. It's derived from how she is able to use her words. It's derived from the way she is w able to use the lusts of the flesh. It's derived from the great power that she has uh, accumulated from not just being personal and, and a singular entity, but she has her influence spread out among her little harlots that she has mothered in this life. Next thing we learn about her, we've learned that she sits upon many waters, she's got great power and wealth, she has that cup of judgment and boasts in holding that thing, and she's identified as a giver of death, though she would offer it as if it was something good and something uh, righteous. Next, you see that she's in bed with the world leaders. She's the uh, mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. It says that in, uh, <clears throat> in verse 2, that it's the fornication, and it says in verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Back in Revelation 17, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk, with the wine of her fornication. So not only is she in bed with all of the world leaders, all of these great kings, and caused them to be drunk, she has made the inhabitants of the entire earth to follow after her pernicious ways, her fornication, her sins and abominable wickednesses. So we see her great reach, her influence, her power, her everything that she has is something of great awe-inspiring marvel. It's awful what she can do this woman, this Babylon. And it even shows that she's able to draw in the minds and hearts of good believers. Look at verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? He says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So we're going to transition from dealing with the woman to dealing with specifically the beast. But he had to ask the question as John looked upon her and, and had great admiration for her power, for her influence, for her reach. It was awe-inspiring to him, and his, his jaw even might have dropped before the angel as he looked, and the angel had to kind of wake him up and say, Wherefore didst thou marvel? Why are you marveling after this strange woman? we got to look at an application like that and, and, and think about the last days where the Bible says in Matthew 24, 24, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There will be signs, there will be wonders, that if it were possible, the elect would even be deceived by them and be drawn away unto following after an uh, antichrist, following after a false prophet. But there's probably going to be a lot of moments like this where an angel simply goes to you and says, hey... Wherefore didst thou marvel? Give your head a shake. Stop, stop wandering after the beast. Stop wandering after and marveling after this mystery harlot, right? Focus here. And, and how does he bring the man back to focus? The same way God's going to do it to us, okay? In the last days, we might marvel. We might be, be, be drawn in with the awe-inspiring images and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, great miracles that are done in these last days, these signs and wonders. But what's going to keep us straight is probably an angel, maybe the Spirit of God, just saying, hey, I will tell thee what this all means. The Word of God, right? It's the Word of God that's going to keep us grounded in these last days. He's going to say, hey, listen to these words. Wherefore didst thou marvel? I'm going to tell you the mystery of all of what you've just seen. And the next thing he gets on to is the beast. We've learned a little about the woman. Now let's look at the beast that she is riding upon. First we see the beast, in verse 8, which that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And 
they that dwell on the earth shall wander, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. It talks again that this beast which thou sawest is of a scarlet color. We saw that back a few verses before. Next we see that that beast we see very clearly in verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon that scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So he's got the same colors. He looks just like the woman. He's under the woman. She has dominion over him, but she's also relying on him to carry her about. Okay, so there's kind of that dual relationship. She rides and leads. He's needful to carry and to move her about. It says also that he has seven heads and ten horns. Now, if you would, you can go to Revelation 13, and that's the beast there in verse 1, I believe. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the horns ten crowns, and upon, the he and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And that's the exact same thing that you saw mentioned of this beast that the woman's riding upon. Go down to verse 3, and it mentions this. It says, And I saw one of his heads, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And so he had this deadly wound, and yet he was alive. And that's the exact same thing you find. Go back to Revelation chapter 17. In verse 8, I believe, when the Bible says, in the end of that, and they beheld the beast that was is not and yet is. What is that saying? That's saying that he was at a time in past, lived, existed. He is not. Presently, there is something that is lacking. He, he doesn't exist. He passed away, I believe. And yet, the Bible says is. It's one of those confusing statements where how can you be not and yet be, all right? To, it's, it's one of those, those statements that can only happen in the spiritual realm. Jesus is referred to as, as the one which is, was, and is to come. Here this beast simulating the same things, this great scarlet covered beast is one that was, is not, and yet is. And I believe that's the miracle that is going to be seen by the lost and cause them to worship and wander after the beast. He's going to have some sort of re uh, resurrection experience, which he does before all, including the other signs and wonders that come from the false prophet at that time. It says in verse 9 that he had seven heads, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. In other words, if you got wisdom, look to what's being talked about here. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And so way back when we first dealt with them, we kind of didn't know what these heads would indicate and what they meant. Now God is just giving it to us straight. That's why I love this chapter. It's very, hey, this is a mystery, but let me explain to you what that means. There are seven heads. They are seven mountains. The woman sits on these seven mountains. And people have gone and they've said, well, Rome has seven mountains. And, and there's places in America maybe have seven mountains. And they've talked about all of these different prophecies and applied them to places here that there are seven mountains. Rome is known as the city of seven hills. And, and they try to apply it and just kind of fit what we see in the world into what the Bible is, is telling us. I believe that's not exactly, and we can't just, again, her ways are movable, thou canst not know them. We're not going to nail it down and say she belongs to such and such a city until maybe that time has come and we've seen, we've seen the abomination of desolation put down. We've seen uh, the, the kingdom of the Antichrist start to actually put down some roots and get established. Right now I'm not going to go and try to nail down exactly what I think it is, but these seven heads are seven mountains and the woman sits on it. Verse 10 it says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So there are seven kings over these seven mountains. It says that five are fallen, in other words, they don't exist anymore. One rules at this time, and there and he's going to, and then there is one that is coming, and he will continue but a short space. The eighth, then, if you continue down reading, um, we're in verse 10. Um, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, one yet is, one yet is to come. What do you see in verse 11? It says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So there are still seven kings, and yet there's an eighth king. How does that work? Because he was of them. So I think that there's a king that's going to continue but a short space, 
but that eighth king that comes after him, he was probably the sixth king, perhaps. And when he died, right, when he is not, and yet is, there's going to be a time when he's resurrected. And then as the eighth, he is numbered as the eighth, but he was the sixth to begin with. He was of the seven prophetic kings that we're dealing with right now. So seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet to come. The beast that you're, we're talking about now, he is the eighth, but he's also of the seven and shall go into perdition. Go to verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So we have seven clear kings, and then we have these that are ten kings, and yet they have no kingdom. How are you a king without having received a kingdom? Well, eventually the Bible here records that they will receive power as kings in order to rule, and they'll be given that by the beast. What does that mean? How can you be a king without a kingdom? Think to yourself now, Bill Gates, right? A guy like that that has so much wealth that he holds sway over governments of the world, and yet he, he ruleth as a king, but where's his kingdom? Are you going to call Microsoft his kingdom? Are you going to call the foundations that he started his kingdom? No, no, no. There must be, there must be people in it to be a part of the kingdom. There must be a landmass. It's not a corporation. But they, there are, I believe, ten kings just like this. Men of great wealth, of great stature, of great demonic influence in this world that are moving and manipulating entire nations. Think about it. Our nation right now, we run a deficit, don't we? <laughs> There is one man that is running a supremely high amount of surplus in his bank account. You don't think he could sway nations? When you can literally pay off nations' debts for them, when you can literally give to building projects that kings would be interested, you can pay off all the politicians, you can do whatever you want when you have great sums of money. So that's what I believe is coming, those ten horns, which you see, they are ten kings. Where is their kingdom? I don't see their kingdom. Ah, it's because they are given power as kings, and one day they will rule with the beast, it says here, for one hour. So... <clears throat> We can think about how that might play out. And verse 13 continues, and it talks about these kings. It says, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So in other words, he gives them power to rule as kings, and almost instantaneously they just yield it over. Why? Because they're all bent to fulfilling the one thing that is in their mind and the one thing that is in their hearts. And so they're willing to yield themselves to this beast because he's going to push their own agendas forward. It's a, it's, a self, it's a selfish move by these ten kings. Nevertheless, they do it and are willing to for a time in order to get their true intentions fulfilled by letting someone else do the dirty work for them. They have one mind. They have one desire. They will give their power unto the first beast, and I believe that's political power. And at the same time, there's going to be that second beast, remember from Revelation 13, that's going to be doing great signs and miracles and wonders, that false prophet, and he's going to be doing the same thing. Political power from these kings that have no kingdom are going to be turned over unto the beast. At the same time, the religious beast is going to be doing great signs and miracles, drawing in all the believers and, and religions false or true of the world and pointing them to that same beast. And so that, that you know, they'll have both sides of things. In other words, political people and religious people will both be drawn unto that beast at that time. We can continue on. What is their one mind, do you think? I think the context just gives that away to us. They have in verse 13, one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Verse 14, I believe that's giving their intent. It says, these shall make war with the lamb. That's their ultimate goal, is to just make war with the lamb. But it says, and the lamb shall overcome them. Glory to God. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So their one mind, I believe, and why they give up their political power to the beast is because the beast is leading a great movement against the Lamb and against his people. Here they're calling, called, chosen, faithful saints. That's the people that these beasts, or sorry, these kings, these ten horns, want to see destroyed. And so they're willing to pass over their power for a little bit in order that they would get rid of these people. But God shall overcome them, and he promises that. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8 is a great indication of 
what will eventually happen. Revelation 14 and verse 8, they said, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so she falls by way of the Lamb as he overcomes that great city and that great empire and that great kingdom. Now, remember back in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 7, the Bible said, uh, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So while we have kind of turned our focus to the beast, the ultimate purpose was that, that the angel wanted to show in this chapter, I believe, the beast and the woman and how they work together, the mystery of all that's before us. So read down in verse 15, and here's where he just kind of makes things a little bit more clear for us, right? As he did with the waters, verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we see clearly from the first of the chapter that the woman is riding upon and has a beast, and she's over top of and has dominion over these waters, multitudes, peoples, nations, tongues. And she's doing it and ruling over them through her carnality, through fornication, through just promoting all types of lasciviousness. She's able to turn sway by influencing kings to, to, to fulfill her needs and her desires and what she wants to be done in the world by promoting sex, by promoting drugs, by promoting all this lasciviousness in the world. She's caused that the waters the people, the multitudes, the nations at large are all following after her ways. She's literally taking them along like, like little puppets. How do they do that? Through the media, right? The media tells you what to think. The, the Hollywood tells you what, what is moral. The, 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 the newspapers and all the, the social media is all telling you how you ought to live. And these days, how you are being promoted is how you ought to live is exactly what Mystery Babylon, this whore, this harlot, this uh, mother of the abominations of the earth wants you to do. And so she's over top of them, but she's not alone. It records here that she is riding upon a beast, right? This beast, we see, is made up of seven kings that have kingdoms. It's also made up of ten kings who don't have kingdoms, but they will rule one day for an hour as if they did. They will eventually give up entirely all of their power unto the beast that she is riding upon. Now, the woman's on the beast, and they're over the waters. That's the order of things and how the world's being manipulated. And this is the makeup of the last day kingdom. If you were to say, what is the last day kingdom? Is it, is it um, you know, Rome? Is it the Vatican City? Is it, is it Rio de Janeiro? Is it all these places that have seven mountains, seven hills? Well, I think some of that is kind of deterring us from the spiritual truth of it all, that we're going to see a woman and what she is made up of and embodies literally. Remember, there wasn't, you know, she's on every corner. That doesn't mean that she personally is on every corner. That means that women just like her, just like that mystery Babylon harlot, are on every corner. In other words, her influence spreads far and wide. There's a beast. Well, how does that beast essentially dominate over the whole world? Is it because the beast is everywhere or it's ruling with an iron fist from one nation somewhere over there in Europe? No, it's because there are seven kings associated directly with these beasts. There's also ten kings that rule, though they have no kingdom. Through 17 beings at this time, you can see how it might be easy to rule over a whole world of people and you don't even have to be in one place, right? And they're over the waters and they're controlling and manipulating the waters. But what we see about this kingdom is that it's divided. It's always divided and that's, that's going to be from the beginning. See, even within the satanic kingdom, you never have unity. That's why there always has to be manipulation from the top. Think about it how we have right now. We would say that Judaism is a wicked, like, demonic religion, right? They don't agree with the Muslims. In fact, they're as far apart as they possibly can be, but they're pushing the same agenda without even knowing it. They're in agreement without even knowing it, but they're divided. And no kingdom that is divided against itself can stand. So there's going to have to come a time where either they're going to have to synthesize and agree, or they're just going to push it to a point where they'll just both be wiped out and destroyed by the one that was pulling their strings all along. So it continues on in verse 16. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast... These shall hate the whore. There's the division, right? These ten horns 
which were ten kings that had received no power, in verse 12, they hated her all along, didn't they? But yet for one hour they ruled, and in verse 13, their mind was able to be united to at least give power over to the beast and over to the woman at that time. So they pass this on, though they are already and initially divided. It says, They shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. That's just a picture, I believe, of the, of the, uh, the last day's kingdom at large. Not necessarily just an attack on a single woman. Verse 17 says, For God hath put it in their hearts. And this is the this is the, the, the bottom line of it all, is that these all nations are think that they're being manipulated and controlled and moving towards one agenda, and eventually they're going to fill their own hearts, desires, and minds and fulfill what they want to get personally out of this last day's kingdom. But ultimately, it's God that is putting in their hearts to fulfill His will. Not their will. They're not going to get what they desire out of this. God's going to get His will out of this. They're going to give their kingdom unto the beast until what? The words of God shall be fulfilled. Not the words of the beast, not the words of the woman, not, not her smooth as oil words that come off of her tongue. But rather, it's going to be God's will that is fulfilled in all of this. In verse 18 it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And so we see again that picture given that this woman, this mystery woman, she sits everywhere and yet she still has a home base, doesn't she? She is a great city. She is um, a, a great um, metropolis that reigneth over the kings of the earth. And so we can't, that's why I believe, we can't just nail down any one thing because her ways are movable. Is she a city or is she a, a, an organization that's living here? It's hard to tell from this chapter, isn't it? But she is a city, but she's also got this influence that goes over nations, kingdoms, tongues, people. She's far-reaching in her influence and her effect on this world at large. So you can't just say, oh, this is New York City. Oh, this is, um, this is Brazil. This is the Vatican. This is... You can't just nail that down because she's always got her finger and her hands on something else in some other nation, some other city, some other people. It's going to be really hard until the very last days when what we see in 16, chapter 16 and verse 19 is this. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's probably going to be the moment where we all go, okay, that makes sense. Now we know what that city was. Now we know where Satan's seat was. Now we know where the throne of, of darkness resided. And it was that city that felt the fullness of the wrath that split into three pieces. And finally God saw it fit to judge according to his will he given us. So I like this chapter and it helps to take what you've learned from it. And then start to, and I haven't completely done this, but I've just tried to deal with this chapter at large. But now you can take and look at Babylon. You can look at the woman. You can look at the beast. You can look at the, the ten horns and where they applied. You can look at the seven kings and go back to Daniel and start to pull things out of there. This chapter really helps to tie it all together. Up until now, it seemed like some of the things were a little bit of guesswork. But this chapter really clarifies it. And now as we turn into 18 and 19, I believe we're going to be able to take a lot of truths that we've already learned in the context of previous chapters, and we'll be able to pull them forward, and then revelation will finally be fulfilled. It will reveal to us exactly what God hopes to reveal to us. So I'm